In the reign of Augustus, one wealthy man left his heirs 4,116 slaves, 3,600 pairs of oxen, 257,000 other cattle, and 60 million sestertii in cash, along with vast estates and many other assets. In his will, he ordered his heirs to spend 1,100,000 sestertii on his funeral. At a time when most men earned between 500 and 1,000 sestertii in an entire year, riches on this scale were staggering. And there were other Romans who were even wealthier. The fabulously rich Crassus owned estates worth 200 million sestertii, along with many thousands of slaves, hundreds of buildings in the city of Rome, and dozens of silver mines in the provinces. The wealthiest Romans, in short, possessed fortunes on a scale excelled only by kings, emperors, and modern billionaires. In this video, which is sponsored by CuriosityStream, we'll explore how they made and invested their money. Elite Roman men were expected to devote their lives to public affairs, and for many, such service, whether on a city council or in the Senate itself, was the only real career they ever had. Especially in the late Republican era, when governors were more or less expected to plunder their provinces, a public career could be very lucrative. But under the empire, despite the large salaries paid to high officials, only a handful of imperial favorites grew rich. Most elite Romans made their money in the private sphere. Although the great majority had inherited wealth, few were complacent about their fortunes. It was normal for a wealthy Roman to act, in some ways, much like a modern investor, diversifying assets and seeking high-return investments. There were bankers in every substantial Roman city, but the elite tended to use them only for a few specialized transactions, such as making payments at a distance. They usually preferred to keep their ready cash at home, in iron safes like the one pictured here. Wealthy families might have a few gold bars in their strongbox, along with piles of gold and silver coins. One first-century senator never left home without a wagon carrying gold worth a million sestertii. Usually, wealthy Romans kept only a small fraction of their wealth in the form of cash. When they purchased a house or estate, they did not pay with tens of thousands of coins. Instead, they performed a transaction on paper, either issuing a promissory note or exchanging debts and property titles. Like most pre-modern elites, rich Romans kept the majority of their wealth in property. The safest and most prestigious properties were country estates, normally worked by some combination of free tenants and slaves. The wealthiest Romans owned whole networks of estates, scattered across the empire. Though not especially profitable, the typical annual return was something like 5 or 6 percent. Revenue from these properties added up. A poet mentions one man who earned 3 million sestertii each year from his estates. Especially in the city of Rome itself, elite Romans also invested in urban real estate, baths, warehouses, and, above all, apartment buildings. Crassus famously owned teams of slaves trained as firemen and builders. Whenever a tenement caught fire, he would rush to the scene, purchase the burning structure at a knockdown price, and then send his slaves in to extinguish the blaze and reconstruct the building. Even Cicero, who was only modestly wealthy for a senator, owned about a million sestertii of rental properties in the city of Rome. One investor made a lucrative career of buying houses, adding heated baths, and selling them for large profits. Before we continue our exploration of how the wealthiest Romans made and managed their money, a quick word about this video's sponsor. CuriosityStream is a streaming service dedicated to quality, fact-driven documentaries. For those of us intrigued by ancient history, for example, CuriosityStream offers an impressive array of content, including this in-depth look at the victims of Vesuvius in Pompeii. I was even more intrigued by this documentary on how cutting-edge technology is helping scholars read the carbonized scrolls found in the villa of the papyri at Herculaneum. And I was thrilled to discover an entire series called Roman Megastructures, which explores the greatest achievements of ancient architecture and engineering. History documentaries are just a small part of what Curiosity Stream has to offer. If you'd like to learn more about the world around us through high-quality, fact-driven content, watch Told in Stone. And then, 
Once you're done with my videos, check out CuriosityStream, where true storytelling lives. To sign up, use the code in the video description for a large discount. Back to the show. In addition to real estate, elite Romans invested heavily in slaves. Although their numbers were greatest during the late Republic, there were millions of slaves in all periods, performing every conceivable job from field laborer to imperial accountant. Crassus, in fact, regarded slaves as the most valuable part of his property. Besides the thousands who worked as estates, he had hundreds of his slaves trained to serve as readers, table servers, stewards, scribes, and silversmiths, among many other professions, and hired them out by the day. Other wealthy Romans trained slaves to serve as quasi-independent artisans, setting them up in shops with a small stock of borrowed capital. These slaves were allowed to keep part of their earnings, and could eventually use their savings to buy their freedom. Even after they were free, they retained economic ties to their former masters, who might loan them money to invest in their businesses. Property, in the form of real estate, slaves, and other possessions, was the foundation of most wealthy Romans' fortunes, or that, at least, was what they wanted their peers to think. Trade was not regarded as a respectable occupation, and Roman senators were actually prohibited by law from direct involvement in commerce. But since there were huge profits to be made in this way, even senators found ways to take part. Cato the Elder, for example, set up an investing association whose members financed ventures in overseas trade. The scale of such enterprises could be impressive, as could the profits. An Egyptian papyrus, for example, preserves part of a contract between an extremely wealthy Roman investor and a merchant sailing from Egypt to India. The merchant's profits from that single voyage were at least seven million sestertii, equivalent to the value of a huge estate in central Italy. Some wealthy Romans also earned income from the interest on loans. This was especially visible during the late Republic, when senators loaned money to provincial cities and foreign kings. Typically, however, wealthy Romans made their loans to individuals, often at the standard interest rate of 12%. Debt claims, written records of outstanding loans, made up an important part of most late Romans' portfolios, and circulated almost as freely as cash, being transferred and sold. The philosopher Seneca, who happened to also be one of the empire's wealthiest men, reportedly held 40 million sestertii of debt claims in a single province. A few Roman magnates became, in effect, one-man banks, with agents working in the Forum and even in the provinces. The portfolio of a wealthy Roman, in short, could be impressively diversified. Income streamed in from the revenues of his estates, the rents of his urban properties, the earnings of his slaves, the profits of his commercial enterprises, and the interest of his loans. In combination, perhaps, with a government salary and legacies from well-placed friends, all this was usually more than enough to finance conspicuous consumption in the best aristocratic style. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Tolden Stone on Patreon. You might also enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.